So this poem is called Thirst Quencher. I am doing my best as I give him my worst. This affords me no rest. At this game, I'm well hearsed. It can feel like a test as I feel I could burst, but for sure I am blessed to be given this thirst. Though myopically stressed, I've in no way been cursed. I'm secure in his nest, and by his hand I'm nursed. Yes, this life is a jest that I've slowly reversed in my desert-like quest to place him alone first. And when I can divest the last bit I've rehearsed, then he'll fulfill my request with the wine he's dispersed. For I'll then be undressed and no longer adverse to the drunken love fest where the cleansed are immersed. There's some interesting notes to it that help uh, with the poem, but I'm not going to read those this time. Okay, um, there's a lot of paradox in the uh, spiritual world, as Baba has pointed out. And um, I was talking with a friend very recently about this, that Baba says, you know, you're yearning for God and any experiences you have um, should be held within like a fire within, but no smoke escapes from the lips. At the same time, he said, you know, share your experiences if you feel they're helpful to other people or might be. Erich relates that containing your personal love for him increases the potency of him within. So this is a poem to that effect. And then there will be a couple of paradoxical poems that um, I had a hard time deciding whether to read or not. This is called To Sir With Love, Sealed With a Kiss, the, the Preservation and Revelation of His Pleasure. Some of that is just comment on the title. <clears throat> on toes I tip, lest his love slip from where it fans a fire. I've sealed the lip in case I trip, exposing heart lamps spire. No sound or smoke to make me choke must leak to drain his brilliance. It's no, it is no joke to always cloak love's light through steadfast diligence. Yet it can grow and even glow when one conceals this treasure. For without show one comes to know Silence unseals his pleasure. So don't breach, so don't breach lips brim. Don't sink, just swim. Disclosure is remiss, sir. Have just one whim to just please him and closure in one kiss, sir. Baba has said, seeing light, having overwhelming inner experiences, this is not spirituality. Such phenomena are only a medium to attract the pilgrim to the path. One should not be fooled and get ensnared. There is danger in the enchantment. Um, regarding this poem I just read, um, I'd like to point out that it should not be taken as a personal fact, but rather as a pointer toward which he desires us at least me in particular, to aim. Um, Baba has said, do you know what real love is like? The flame of love within does not even give it out smoke for others to see. When you love me, you burn within yourself and yet seem cheerful with a broad smile upon your lips. You bear the pangs of separation calmly and quietly. So, that being said, I'm going to share a couple of poems 
about some, I guess you call them experiences that happened to me. I, I would like to uh, preface the reading of these two poems by saying they are not of the same caliber, in my opinion, as some other experiences I had, which were more altered states of consciousness dealing with being thrown into a prayerful state or a, a loving state. These are not of that caliber, even though they were kind of fantastic. <laughs> so, this one is called Amartithi Vision, Adrift on Love Light's Way, also known as Visitation Rites. And it's from just after Amartithi in 2005. Into your arms I drifted, from here to nowhere there, as gross world laws were lifted, revealing lion's lair. A perfect black hole tunnel awaited me to be the guest that he would funnel into a brand new me, temporarily. Inside I witnessed beauty, both glowing and refined, and how this gift did suit me can scarcely be defined. He dressed me for a vision, most subtle and sublime, with delicate prevision precision, rare lights revolved in rhyme. Amidst this glorious gleaming, within this perfect void, came insight gently streaming, which I could not avoid. For in ego's detachment, the mind's complex blockade succumbed to quick unlatchment from old world's steel stockade. I saw our human life forms as vacant shells outlined to house the light that transforms old habits we've designed. And when that job is finished, then only light remains. It's glowing undiminished, our being it sustains. With this new information, I drifted into sleep and dreamt of my vocation, to die but not to weep. This means to let the light shine while smiling through its heat, to gladly give up what's mine, to leave it at his feet. When I awoke, I rested upon the afterglow of Amartithi vision. I let the spirit flow. Charged Indian music sifted into my soul to burn the memory he be gifted to where I must return. For soon it's back to jail land to serve out in his cause my duty there in veil land according to his laws. Then I'll recall the visit to Baba's wonderland and subtly relive it to help me take my stand on truth within the prison to which I am consigned until he has arisen when I've fully resigned. Yes, in this world that's darkening, he's shown a wondrous sight, that vision which keeps hearkening, a powerful guiding light. And this second one, um, I guess it'll be obvious in the poem, I'm not sure, but has to do with um, nature quite a bit and nature um, beings. It's, it, it, uh, the poem came to me the same day and the experience came to me at the same time as the one I just read. Yeah. Reverie in Fairyland. I should mention that uh, part of what I was seeing was th through the window at the place where I was staying. The window had bars on it. I was staying at James Cox's house in India. I was there for half a year at that time. And um, I was so happy. 
happier even than these experiences I'm reading about, that I was living so close to the Samadhi. Um, no one was at that time living any closer to the Samadhi, and I felt that very strongly. Reverie in, in Fairyland. For half an hour past windows bars, I mused on nature's glories. From ages yore I'd sat before as green life sang her stories. And now the clock stands still again in deference to God's ories, H-O-U-R-I-E-S. O oh, wondrous love, praise dancing here in everlasting beauty, bestowing grace on ravaged soul, besieged with angst acutely. How marvelously you sing and sway without forced toil or duty. Behold this growth from Mother Earth in yonder field of vision. Behold the nature of this life bespeaking his precision of perfect silent ode to love devoid of all division. Yet so alive that separate souls in oneness mute their squawking when splendor from another world or the natural world inside their hearts start talking in tones bereft of man-made man -made words whilst in this garden walking. Now and again let go and see how greenery's adoring and takes a cue and take a cue from what they do praise him without imploring. Then to your world return in peace without mind's ways obscuring and feel the calm of nature's balm instead of quakes and quivering. Well knowing that this gift from God is beauteous natural living, inspiring us towards silent love through natural thanksgiving. I will have to say it was quite something. Uh, I wrote later on, I don't want to go back to my world. Take me back to your world. Capital Y. <laughs> this one is called uh, Once Upon a Rhyme. The alternate title is Hearing Aid. Um, and I thought this could be a candidate to be the opening poem of Fragrance, the poem is from 1989 onward, if it ever gets published into a book form. And I'm going to read the notes to the poem afterwards. Now once upon a rhyme, within its words sublime, sublime, truth blossomed like a rose, unfurling what one knows. Beneath the tandem lies, illusory thoughts comprise. A touchstone melody invites us all to see and breathe in deep and free what flowers eternally. To hear this one, to hear this soundless sound in words must feel our bound, requires a mind that's still and heart turned toward his will. All others in their quest read lines they seek to test. So enter in or not, no essence or word rot. Choose one within the rhyme or two illusions chime. Should flowering be your choice, you'll hear the author's voice. Duality's defeat now tendered at his feet. Then time stands still for those in rhythm with the rose, as they become scent slaves of verse's fragrant waves, which beckon to his ocean in one poetic motion. And these are the notes. Um, it's a 2011 poem that started on Silence Day, the day before Silence Day and was completed the day after. 
The world of illusion is comprised of twosomes, the opposites, good, bad, clever, simple, high, low, yes, no. All of these judgments and many more are conceived in the mind. Reality, on the other hand, is characterized by the heart's essential oneness of love, which transcends the thought and thinking born of the dualistic mindset. How one proceeds goes a long way to determine what one finds. Still, unmindful of one's approach to the poems, whether dualistic or realistic, a rose is a rose is a rose. A rose is, a rose is, a rose is, a rose is. And yet, for the rose to disclose what it knows, only the latter way, only the latter realistic way, once tried, can reveal the motion that leads to the ocean. I'll quote again the perfect master, Jalaluddin Rumi. Love is the reality, and poetry is the drum that calls us to that. The alleged perfect disaster, Philip Krieger adds, may our discrimination prove sufficient for the receptivity of true poetry's unspoiled secrets and the discernment of tainted poetry's lies. For duality is too, too much, T-W-O, T-O-O, much. Whereas reality serves in the clutch, in brief, may a clutch of roses be yours. Okay, true poetry equals the real deal contrasted with the pseudo-spiritual poetry which cleverly adulterates spiritual thought with gross plain desires using emotion-laden, ego-pleasing stylizations and catchwords. The latter reels in the self-serving seekers and the corruptible innocent, whereas real poetry is embraced by the self-honest few and the discerning innocent. This poem is Me Gotta Go, Thank God. And the notes to the poem are rather brief. Erich was once asked by a pilgrim, how do we balance the inner life with the outer life? Erich replied, you're asking the wrong question. Merge the two. This poem also references the soul game. So to remind people of what Baba said the soul game is, I'll read this quote from Baba to penetrate into the essence of all being and significance and to release the fragrance of that inner attainment for the guidance and benefit of others by expressing in the world of forms truth, love, purity, and beauty. This is the soul gain which has any intrinsic and absolute worth. All other happenings, incidents, and attainments can in themselves have no lasting importance. So, me gotta go, thank God. God's other world beauty surrounding me, illusions tight net still confounding me. Each moment plays out this dichotomy, outside of but also inside of me. To balance these inner and outer worlds, is not the real question confronting me. Live only the inside and outward cloak. This merger then plays out the truth in me. But how to accomplish this game of games? Dumb Philip must see that he is not me. Thank God Philip's master is artfully dismembering the fake news that I am me, enabling the soul game progressively to manifest in and outside of me. I'm working towards it anyway. So recently I read some poems which um, were about either states of being that I was put into or spiritual experiences um, 
And I think I made one or two comments about it, but I have some more things to say that might help explain how I feel about such things. Baba said, hearing celestial, celestial music, smelling unearthly smells, seeing circles, colors, and lights have no significance in our illusory. Getting enamored by such experiences is rawness on the path. Love for God is something quite different. Elsewhere, Baba said, although it is good to have inner experiences, it is very dangerous to attach importance to them. If the aspirants are not pre-warned, then even petty experiences prove treacherous and hinder steady progress. Elsewhere, Baba talked about what he considered petty experiences. And to us, gross planers, they might not seem petty at all. They might seem supernatural, and maybe they are, but just reading what Baba says. And this one I can't remember if I read before or not. So I'll read it again just to be safe. Seeing light, having overwhelming inner experiences, this is not spirituality. Such phenomena are only a medium to attract the pilgrim to the path. One should not be fooled and get ensnared. There is danger in the enchantment. And I remember during that phase when I was put into a, a prayerful mode, which didn't completely go away for three and a half months, I felt like I couldn't live without it. And um, that's not a good way to feel. <laughs> Anyway, Baba takes care. So, this first poem we're going to read in this session is called The Present, a simple poem. Past lives are lifeless. Live now, it's priceless. Be in the present, or else you're absent. There is no future. Right here's God's treasure. When one forgets self, then one gets his wealth. This gift is timeless, the time of true bliss. O oh God, so simple, may we be simple. And as often happens in my poetry, there's a double meaning to may we. The French M-A-I-S-O-U-I, but may we be simple. May we means but yes. So the notes to the poem, I'll read this time. God is simple. It is you all who make it difficult. That's paraphrasing Baba. I think the actual quote is, the truth is very simple. It is you all who make it difficult. And here's a quote from Mani. It's been said elsewhere, but I first heard it from Mani. The past is history. The future is a mystery, but the present is a present from God. And Baba said, live more and more in the present, which is ever beautiful and stretches away beyond the limits of the past and the future. This one is called Your Will. And I may read a little bit from the notes. This happened in the tomb, and there were lots of things like, well, I'll just read the poem. Shower me with rose dew, then throw me in the wake. Flower me in your hue then cleanse me for your sake. Do whatever is your will, but see that I come too. Grind me up in your mill, but keep me here with you. 
Part of my notes say, it is said that when the Buddha preached a sermon, the heavens bedewed the petals of this plant with rain, with raindrops. So that made me think of shower me with rain dew. And also the tomb covering seemed to be showering petals down the design. This one is called Nothing to Gain, a plea. So it's something that is a, a plea for it. Forever grateful let me be what you would that I should be. Push me down so low that I prostrate, rise to reach your sky. Forever, forever grateful without pause, stopping time and space's laws. Pull me to the breaking point where these tears for you anoint. Forever grateful for God's hammer that has led my mind to stammer while it shapes my life anew with each blow that rains from you. Forever grateful, O oh dear Lord, for the mercy of your sword, cutting out all self-sown sin, leaving nothing where I've been. And this is, um, was written the day after Mansari passed on. I always thought of her as the drop-in Mandali. You could pretty much drop in any time and you were welcome, have tea and conversation and to hear her wonderful stories. What a, what a, what a gal. Mm. So, um, and I wrote this along with a, a short note. I'll read the short note too. I wrote it to um, the Mandali after she passed on. Mansari, a reflection. Mansari has gone, but where has she gone? Gone to him, king of hearts, full, full with love. Mansari remains, and where she remains? On the hill of our hearts, filled with love. Then I wrote, Dear family, I am writing to you in deeply shared feelings for Baba's dear Mansari, whose home visa came after playing the game, taking only his name, Avatar Meher Baba Kije, Love Philip. She used to say, his name plays the game, something like, there's more to the rhyme. And she was always wondering when her visa was gonna come, meaning when it was her time to drop the body. By the way, she died um, she died on Dooney Day. I'm not sure. I thought it was November, but maybe it was later. Anyway, um, she loved the Dooney, and I didn't know this until near the end of her life, but whenever it was Dooney Day, she'd walk down to the railroad tracks to view it from a distance because, of course, she didn't have permission to cross the railroad tracks. But I'd never seen her um, that close to going down the hill, except once. I guess I'll share that story now. She could, um, you know, Baba said she's to stay on the hill and she's not to leave. And she had no problem with that. Um, when people would say, don't you miss being out there more? And she said, why? The whole world comes here to me. <laughs> That's how she saw it. But one day I was down on the road near where the old Pilgrim Center is, waiting for the bus to come to take me back into town. It was half a rupee back then, 50 paisa. And all of a sudden I saw Mansari going by in the car and I couldn't believe my eyes. She would never disobey Baba. Well, it turns out she had Baba's permission to leave the hill either for medical reasons or if one of her dogs was sick <laughs> and she had a very bad toothache and was going to the dentist. So 
Mansari used to say, well, I'll save that for when I tell, Mansa, when I tell Mandali stories. Aha. This one's called No Other, the No Life Song, in contrast to the New Life Song. I'm going somewhere else undercover. No path or powers hold for this lover. No worldly sister, dad, nor a mother. Just me to you betrothed like a brother. Above these earthly dreams one must hover, subsumed within your life and no other. Subsumed within your life and no other. Thank God, thank God, praise God, thank God, thank God, thank God, praise God, thank God. And then the first 14 lines repeat, and that's the end of the No Life song. Let's see what I have here. Um, I'm not sure what these notes say. I'll just take a gamble and hope they're legible. I'm going somewhere else undercover refers to a transitioning from where I ordinarily experience myself to be at to movement toward him unbeknownst to me other than a fleeting sense or feeling that it's happening and that it's certainly not the traditional path of the plains with its attendant powers that we Baba lovers traverse with him but rather he takes us safely with him undercover, veiled it is, as he says, the no path of self-annihilative love for his lovers. Anyway, after watching part one of the Mia Repa DVD, people usually pronounce it Mila Repa, perfect master, um, the dim and fleeting yet potent and touching experience of his saying, I'm going somewhere else undercover, hit me. Over the next two hours, the rest of the poem, along with its title, unveiled itself, continuing with its non-attachment theme, non-attachment except to him. Anyway, some of these poems are actually ahead of where I'm at, but the feeling comes, and there's a temporary feeling. Ah, this one is called the Eyes Have It. It's a poem about Mera, written July 16th, 2012. I think I'll read the opening, the notes to the poem as an opening. True, the beauty of Mera's matchless love for beloved Baba. As seen reflected in her eyes, cannot be fully taken in by us ordinary lovers, but it can most definitely be glimpsed, deeply moving us in ways and in places of which we cannot adequately speak. However, this much I feel can be said, the vote is in and the eyes have it. The eyes have it. At a loss for words I write of her inward gaze so bright. Seeing this one picks up light, shining forth from love's clear sight. He is captured in those eyes that bespeak all lovers' cries, which illuminate the prize that one day we'll realize. Thank you, Mera, mirror pure, showing us how to adore God himself, whom we implore, help us all to love him more. This next one is called Have It Your Way, a senseless poem, or a senseless poem. One pilgrim took a winding road and wound up in a ditch. Another strikes the path he strode avoiding every hitch. Two hikers faring on the way to where all blessings flow. One raced ahead and lost his head. The other lets things go. 
Don't bother me with fatherly advice on how to travel, said number one before he'd done the deeds he couldn't unravel. I must have you, said number two, the one without a second. The time has flown since I've been shown the way you clearly beckoned. Now number one became undone by sights along the highway. He ran to gawk, then stopped to talk, and made each place his byway. But number two knew what to do. He steadily kept walking. No bright manure could serve to lure him from the one he's stalking. To gamble on a side street drawn from sensory perception will surely cause a lengthy pause, the product of deception. But going straight past Maya's bait, though painful for a while, gives pleasure in avoiding sin and beats it by a mile. The choice is yours to open doors that lead to every notion or let things be, he'll turn the key and drown you in his ocean. Both are in luck for no one stuck forever on the pathway. The clock is set and you can bet each pilgrim has his bath day. So choose the fire of self-desire or love light's burning ember Eventually, you'll be made free through total sense surrender. This is called, instead of a state of the union message, a brief state of the non-union message. <laughs> so many things used to be that now this term means me. And what remains from growing pains I do not know or see. In short, I'm lost and cannot hold to one, anything or one. This is the cost, one life gone cold and nothing else and nothing can be done. So I just play my shrinking role and grope through darkness falling until I pray will come the day my Savior will come calling. Obviously, it's one of those times when you're down and not feeling stuff. But um, when I say lost, I never left Baba by any stretch of the imagination. And this one, let's see. I don't know what I'm going to nickname it because the title's <laughs> about 30 words long. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, and it's got plays on the word awful and awful and awful, A-W-E-F-U-L-L, -L, etc. Anyway, it's a jolly lolly, a jolly jolly dream come true. One fateful day I heard him say, my order you must follow. This life you've led shall now be dead if all you did you swallow. The things I'd done, the webs I'd spun, were not much to my liking. So he began right there and then, encouragement most striking. I winced in pain, but, but soon did gain the point that he was making. Drink up, you fool, this is the rule for those whose thirst I'm slaking. One final blow, then here we go, I closed my eyes and downed it. Consuming all, I left it all, as by his grace I'd found it. Now I can see, for I'm not me, since Saki packed a wallop. For that last drink snapped Maya's link, completing God man's call-up. Obviously, I'm not really in that place. But this is what came through as, a, I guess, a harbinger and some temporary experience. Um, this next one has two versions. I'm just going to read one of the versions. It's called That Truth. Now I lay me down to wake, allowing him my dreams to take, giving up this living lie so that the truth I'll realize.
And this one is called My Dying Day, written in 2006. Come on, I have to have you, I said to him one day. In silent tones you answered, just let me have my say. And so I strive to let you speak through me in your way in all of this world's transactions until my dying day. Looks like this is the last one for today. Yeah, oh, I see. It's a pun coming back from India. It's called Arrival Home, home with a small h, the U.S. Um, in the last line of the poem, it's talking about home with a capital H. Upon re-entry to the West, I feel as though I've stubbed my toe. For while I try to do my best, here showers of love have ceased to flow. Yet midst this seeming cruel jest, his reign of love has eased the blow. For I'm still wet and know I'm blessed from home sent mist, sweet overflow. Then there seems to be a parenthetical ending, maybe it's a coda. Never mind. If you don't care for what I've said, erase it from your mind instead. Just know for sure it came so free without this mind to censor me. Um, that could apply to all the poems, I guess. <laughs> okay. Fini. Hello, back again. This poem is called Dying to be Free, a challenge to myself with a small s. There's no more Red Rover. I've dared to come over. Young child plays now done, mate. A man's work means checkmate. It's time now stop crying. Find joy in real dying and in his indenture, embrace death's adventure till game's up, forsake me, and my Lord can take me. So this is kind of a fantasy poem. It's not a fait accompli, obviously, but it's what came to me. This next poem is called Tunnel View. And I had recently come back from uh, Yosemite National Park where there's one of the great views is called Tunnel View. And that can be contrasted with Tunnel Vision. Tunnel View is panoramic and sees a lot. And Tunnel Vision, well, it's obvious from familiarity with the phrase, you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel or it's way off. You're not the one I'm looking for. You're not involved for love's sake. You look to what it, you're in it for and thereby see to love's wake. If only you could see what's here instead of your reflection, the gates of light would open wide for your insight's reception. Alas, this game twixt you and me has drawn to its conclusion Yet still I pray you'll one day see beyond blind eyes confusion. I shall not send these lines to you, twould only bring division. For what this poem's all about is gaining inner vision. I guess it's pretty clear that had to do with a, a relationship of sorts. This one Let's see if I want to read the notes to it or not. I'm going to read some of the notes to this poem. It's got a very long title, which will <laughs> maybe be abbreviated later on. It's called, We Used to Be Much Older Then. We're Younger Than That Now. Talking about my Baba J -J generation. Then I have a footnote with a nod to Robert Zimmerman and Pete Townsend. 
that might make sense to some people who were of my generation and not to others. And about notes, some of the notes of the poem are as follows. Is the form of it a sonnet? The answer is yes. Can you wear it like a bonnet? Can your head and heart count on it? Try it on and see, doggone it. So, this poem refers to the large wave of Baba lovers who came to Baba roughly in the late 60s and the early 70s. Now, age-wise, we're in our late 60s and 70s. And it goes on. So, hopefully other people have or will write um, Baba poetry about their generation. We were young and beautiful. Now we're old, more dutiful. Old life ways and willfulness changed into his will in us. Blessed by God and Father Time, we are the sons who've lived this rhyme. Pray we stay forever young, making sure his song is sung. We're trying anyway. This next one is called Follow the Leader. Though, though the time's now, what to do now? Baba, your help I so need now. Oh, my dear God, how one bleeds now. Don't let the false supersede now. I know that my ways, I know that my ways impede now. Stop my spin, I'll take heed now. Take me all in, I accede now. Please, Lord, you must intercede now. Goodbye, cruel world, I secede now. Hello, new life, my white steed now. Someday we'll live what I read now. Take it as more than a screed now. Then he will give what I plead now. Therefore, let's hope it's agreed now that our full-time crying need now is to let go with God's speed now, all but his feet. That's our creed now. Through the dark night, we proceed now, holding on tight as decreed now, till we reach light by his lead now. Then we can say, I am freed now. Praise God and give him the lead now. This is called My Dream. So be mindful it's a dream, not a fact of reality. Well, some of it is the reality. Walking, talking in a dream, crying, laughing in a dream. All I see is my dream. What is me is a dream. Yet there's God in this meme. Yes, there's God in the seam. Everything trumps no thing when I waken from my dream. A mesmerizing, powerful dream coming loose through God longing, vaporized like fire wrought steam when his sun burns up my dream. And this is called Daydream. You sit astride your white horse throne, awaiting our reunion. Heart opened wide, I come alone, gone mad for your communion. Quick to your side, the love gates thrown, no room for life's confusion. For God's springtide drowns all I've known, the end to this illusion. Yes, now the bride and groom are sown into one holy fusion. The past has died, all falseness flown. There's only love's profusion. And the post-poem proclamation, Hail, mighty God, hail, Savior mine. Hail, King of love and beauty. Hail, avatar, both man and God. To love you is love's duty. So the preface to the last poem dream should have been the preface to this poem. It's not fully realized. 
and the first one, daydream, is more of a, a reality. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if that made sense. I'll dream on. So, this poem is called Home, and as I've mentioned before during these recordings, um, to me, my real home, my spiritual home, is Meribad and Merizad. As I returned from India one trip, I received an email from a couple friends. It said, great to hear from you, so freshly returned from India. Somehow, somehow I feel you never really leave India. And it goes on. And it rem well, I won't say more, but there's similar <laughs> things people have said when I come back from India. This is called home. This is my home, not a foreign land. Where I must reside is the foreign land, but I do not live there, I live here, where he lives most freely, most lively, most really. I am home now, and by his grace I shall never leave home. Meaning my spiritual home. Meribad, Merizad. And this sort of um, is similar in a way. It's called In Love, parts one and two. It has a coda, it has a preface or a prologue. And um, so I'll read the notes, some of the notes to the poem and the preface before the poem. Erich recalled that Baba once used the analogy of his two eyes to describe the two main sites of his spiritual work, Meribad and Merizad. He gestured to those around him that while the two were independent of each other, together they formed one image, himself. And as reported in the book Turning of the Key by Bill LePage, Erich added, Never differentiate between the two places. They are equally important. So, this is, there are just a handful of poems that might be good to be set to music. And the fact that this has two parts, I refer to it as two-part harmony. In Love, Part One. My beloved Meribad, perfect cradle of pure God, homeland of my heart and mind. Oh, what joy herein to find. E internally, I crawl to thee, specifically your samadhi, where from you rule majestically. When there again to die, I dare to live again without a care in love. That was part one, in love part two. Equal partner, Merizad, living quarters of my God. What a silent masterpiece lingers for the soul's release. Here too in spirit I go flying, experiencing life while dying. For visitation to these places sees that one will come up aces when pursued in love. And the coda reads thusly, atmospheric wonderland, in you I bathe, creator of your place of places, to you I bow. I thought I had some poems about bowing down, I guess, I don't know what happened. Oh, well that one ends that way, and this next one has that theme. As a preface, I'll say that Merwan Jessawala used to say to us, bow down to him in such a way that you never raise your head again. There's actually a short uh, prayer. Well, there's two little prayers here. The first one's very short, and it's a preface to the one that follows it. It's called the Wayfarer Prayer. I bow down my head and with all my heart pray Dear Baba, be with me the entire way. And this one's called All the Way, and it includes the essence of the Wayfarer prayer that I just read. 
And the phrase in this poem, how I lived, means how I lived before being conscious of Baba. All the way, how I lived, I cannot say, but all I lived is yesterday. Now I live another way, one bound to love, yet cloaked in gray. How now to give and demons slay in shaded light throughout each day. Bow now my head and with heart pray, dear God be with me all the way. That's it for today.